All right, so if you are here this morning, <clears throat> I preached on biblical marriage. And as I mentioned this morning, you know, I kind of made a little bit of, of time to make sure that people understood that the, the spirit that it's being preached in and, and, you know, sermons like this are real sensitive, they're real personal oftentimes with people. And um, you have to be ready just to receive the word of God. And I'm not here to, to make my own spin on things. I'm not here to make people upset. I'm not here to make people happy. I'm here to just preach the word of God. That's my job, and there are important subjects, and especially when we live in a society that, that has strayed so far from the Bible in these particular areas, especially regarding marriage and divorce. Marriage, you know, this morning I preached on just, just husband and wife's roles, wife being submissive, the, the husband loving his wife being in charge. That's something that's looked down upon today. I mean, that's something that people get mocked and ridiculed for today and is, is practically a sin in the eyes of many people today because they've strayed so far from the Bible and from biblical truth. And that's what the world will think, and that's what the world of philosophy is. And divorce is really no different because we live in a society that has so many divorces and people get divorced for so many reasons and it's become acceptable and it's just become something that's, well, it's just part of society, it's just the way it is. Kids are growing up just with this understanding that marriage is like the next level of dating and if you don't like your spouse, then you just get a divorce. Mom and dad got a divorce, they're remarried. This person got a divorce, they're remarried. Well, they didn't like that person. That didn't go very well. So what do we do? We get a divorce and then we move on. Move on to the next one. And it's tragic. It's sad. It's sad that kid, that, that the next generation is being brought up with all this. And that's why it's so much more important now to just preach this truth and make sure it's very clear and very evident what the Bible teaches about this. And I don't preach sermons like this, especially sermons like this, for people who have already been divorced to like make you feel bad about something that you did however long ago, whatever, you got a divorce. That's not the purpose of this. The primary purpose is to teach, just teach biblical doctrine, one, for people who haven't made that mistake yet, and yes, I said mistake, of getting a divorce, because it's not right, I'm going to show you that from Scripture, in fact, the, the, the title of my sermon tonight, I had biblical marriage this morning, it's biblical divorce tonight. And there is a form of biblical divorce, and we're going to go through that. There is a form, there is one way in which divorce was acceptable according to God's law. One. Not many ways, not for every reason, like the Pharisees wanted to say, there was one instance in which divorce was appropriate, or not even appropriate, just allowable. When it was acceptable, when it was allowed by God's law. We're going to get into that. And this is needed today. People need to understand this. And especially, we've got people going to be getting married in a couple weeks. It's important for them. It's important for the kids to hear this. You know, when you make a vow, you're making a vow unto God. You're making a vow unto your spouse. But I'm going to get too far ahead of myself. Let's start off. We started off in Malachi chapter number 2. And I want you to look at verse number 14 because we're just going to look at Malachi 2 just to get God's perspective of divorce. How does God feel about divorce? What does God think about it? Verse number 14, the Bible says, Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. And that term, putting away, is in reference to divorce. When you put away your spouse, people say, you know, in the Bible, you see, this man put away his wife from him. It means he divorced his wife. 
he put her away. That she's no longer part of his family, of his house, with him. She's put away. She's put out. The Bible says here, the God of Israel, the Lord, he hates putting away. God hates that. God hates divorce. This is the way that God feels about it. Continue reading here. It says, For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So not only is the Bible saying that God hates divorce, but in the previous verse, in verse 15, as well as in verse 16, he's referring to dealing treacherously against the wife of his youth, right? The, the, the first wife, the wife of his youth, the, the wife you got married to, your original spouse, you deal treacherously against your spouse when you put them away. It's like you're, you're a traitor to them by, by putting them away and divorcing that spouse from you. And that's what the Bible teaches. Don't deal treacherously. Don't put them away. Verse 17, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? Even ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? And people have strayed so far today that there's people out there that'll say, you know, Oh, I did right in the sight of God by getting a divorce. It's actually right for me to divorce my spouse. And it's not. It's not what the Bible teaches. We're going to go through and we're going to look at these places. Turn, if you would please, to Deuteronomy chapter 24. We are going to see the only place in God's law that allows for a bill of divorcement to be given. This is it. You know, when you read the Bible, especially you read the Old Testament, you read you know, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, You'll see laws repeated. You'll see, you know, a lot of different references to certain topics and certain crimes and certain laws. But when it comes to divorce, this is it. This is what we get. There's one place. There's not, there's not room to, to have all of these different scenarios and all of these different things. Deuteronomy chapter 24. We're going to see where God allowed a bill of divorce to be given. Verse number one of Deuteronomy chapter 24, the Bible reads, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. That is the situation. Now, he didn't say, And it come to pass she find no favor in his eyes, period. Or it didn't say, because she found no favor in his eyes, then just let him give her a, a bill of divorce. There's a reason why she's not finding it. It's not just, well, I married her. It turns out I don't really like her that much. It turns out we're not really that compatible. Turns out, you know, she's into stuff that I didn't think, you know, whatever. Like it, it, that's, none of that is the reasoning. The reason is because he's found some uncleanness in her. Now, the Bible's not going to get extremely graphic here, but uncleanness is referring to, you know, her, her private area or whatever. This uncleanness, like a disease that she would have only gotten through not being um, true to what she says she was when they got married. And typically in the Bible, you're going to see the assumption in Scripture is that people are virgin when they're married. That's just, I mean, that's what the Bible teaches over and over again. We're going to see actually in Deuteronomy 22 in just a minute how the Bible treats um, like a woman that says she's a virgin and then actually isn't when they get married and what the Bible teaches about that, that how, how strong of a view that God puts on people retaining their virginity and that it's not some loose thing. It's not like, like in the day we live in today, it's just, it's like not just acceptable, but expected that young people are just going to give up their virginity and lose it and they're just going to go off, whether it be on prom, whether it be on spring break, whether it be at college, whether, it be, you know, whatever it is, that this is just going to happen because that's the way that kids are and you just better expect it. And people, some people rejoice in it. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, buddy, hey, you know, you're going to... Encouraging people to, to commit fornication and just get involved in this sin. It's wicked as hell. And I don't care if it's tolerated, accepted, promoted in the culture we live in today. The Bible says it's, it's extremely wicked and it's wrong. 
So let's go back to Deuteronomy 24. We're going to get, I keep on getting ahead of myself a little bit, but Deuteronomy 24, it says, Because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Verse 2, And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So basically, it goes on to teach that once the, the husband's put away his wife, he's found uncleanness in her and says, all right, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divorce this person because he can't deal with that. So she goes off. Once she gets married to someone else, she can't go back to him again. If years go by and she's then married and then she gets divorced from that person or that guy dies or whatever, the Bible's saying, too late. You had your chance and that's it. That's over. And the Bible even says that it's an abomination if she were to go back to him. Like That's it. That's done. It's, a, it's kind of a, a final thing that's supposed to just be done. Now, the only thing that would be acceptable is if she did not go and be with another man and they reconciled uh, without that happening. And we'll get into that. The New Testament teaches more about that. But flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 22 because that's it. And we're going to get even more clarification on what the Bible teaches about this divorce concept. But that's, I mean, verse number one of Deuteronomy 24, that's the law. That's it. And Jesus just helps us, I think, to understand this even better, what exactly is meant specifically on this subject uh, in the New Testament. And we'll get there in just a minute. But Deuteronomy 22, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. And when it says there, I found her not a maid, it means she's not virgin. It says, Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So basically, this is such a big deal that fathers, parents of the daughter, are retaining proof that their daughter was a virgin on, their, on her wedding night because, because of how much of a slander that is to the family name if she's not a virgin. And if someone comes along like this and says, oh, no, she wasn't, they're saying, no, yes, she was. We raised our daughter right. We you know, we know that she was a virgin on your wedding day, and they basically keep the proof. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but, but essentially they have some proof that that's the case. And then, um, and then it says that it, the guy, the husband, that's just bringing up this false accusation. It says, um, the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. So this guy is trying to figure out a way to divorce his wife because he doesn't like her or whatever. And the Bible saying, no, <laughs> no, you can't. And on, and on top of that, now you have to pay her father a hundred shekels of silver because you're trying to bring this evil name upon, upon a virgin of Israel, right? She was a virgin and you're caught lying. And now, um, now you have to pay this and, and you can't get divorced. You have to stay together. But then it says in verse 20, but if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. Just underscoring how big of a deal that is in God's law. That he says, that's a death penalty. 
If you give yourself off to be a virgin to marry somebody and you're not because you played the whore. Again, look, I didn't write the Bible. That's not, these aren't my words. But I accept them, I believe them, and I, you know what? I think that's right because God said that's right. Marriage in Virginia is supposed to be taken very seriously according to the Bible. And many people may be deceived these days because they didn't grow up with Scripture, because no one taught them these things. Right? I understand how it happens. I didn't know these things growing up. I wish I did, but I didn't. So it's not an excuse for doing the wrong thing. We're still ultimately responsible for our actions. I, but I can see how it happens. But once, it's, it's what you do once you know this information is what really, really matters. What are you going to do about it now? I mean, obviously you can't go change the past if, if, if any of this is stuff that you've been guilty of. But what we can do is still teach for the future and try to get this, this behavior to stop. Turn to Matthew chapter number one. Matthew chapter number one. We're going to get a clear example of somebody who is righteous in the Bible, who is going to follow the, the biblical grounds for divorce, which we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Because in Deuteronomy 24, it says if, if he's unpleased because he's found some uncleanness in her, then he can write her a bill of divorce. In Matthew chapter 1, this is a story of Joseph and Mary, and Joseph finds out that Mary is with child. Joseph and Mary had gotten married. They were espoused to each other. But the marriage was not consummated. They had not come together in union as husband and wife physically. They were married. They were espoused to each other, but it, just, it hadn't been completely fulfilled yet. And that's why it says in verse 18, we'll read this. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. So the Bible saying he was just. He was trying to, be, to make decisions based on the law, based on what he should do, based on according to God's law. He's a just man. He's not trying to do anything outside of God's law. He's being a just man, it says, and not willing to make her a public example. So he didn't want to make Mary some big, you know, make some big show out of this and drag her before everybody. But he did want to put her away. That's why it says, it says he was minded to put her away privily. Privily just means like privately or secretly. It's just, he just wanted to, to end it and just say, okay, you know, we got married, but I mean, obviously she's with child. So... I, can't, I want out of this. She's not who I thought she was. You know, and then, of course, uh, he, you know, an angel appears unto him, the Lord appears unto him in a dream and says, hey, you know, don't worry that the child that, that she's with is of, of the Holy Ghost, that, that um, it's, not, it's not what you think it is. So, and then, of course, he's saying it's married with everything else. But the point is that Joseph was being a just man, so according to the law, that would have been appropriate or acceptable. I don't want to say appropriate. It would have been acceptable, according to God's law, to get a divorce, to write a bill of divorcement because they had not consummated the marriage yet, yet she was found with child, which means essentially there was some uncleanness in her because she supposedly had been with another man. In any other situation, any other couple, any other thing ever on earth, that would have been the case except for in this case with Mary because she wasn't with another man because the, the child was of the Holy Ghost. But that, that would have been acceptable according to God's law. Uh, flip over to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to see Jesus speaking on this subject also. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 31, the Bible reads, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, and notice he puts that in there, except for the cause of fornication, 
causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. And it's important to note that Jesus made this caveat in there, except for the cause of fornication, because that is exactly what the law is stating. Just in, in a different way, by calling it uncleanness. That is what happens. Now, that word fornication is important because fornication is the act, that physical act that a man and woman do together, but that's what's referred to as fornication when, a per, when people aren't married, when it's something that happens premarital, right? Pre-marriage. Because once a person's married and you have that relationship, that's adultery. You've, you, you've, you've commit adultery once that person's married. So, in the law, when someone was to get married to someone, like Joseph and Mary, and see, it's, it's harder to understand this, maybe a little bit today, because we don't deal with marriages the same way, in the sense that Joseph and Mary were married, and they hadn't consummated their marriage yet, right? Typically, in our culture, in these days, it's happening in, in much less time after the marriage, right? So we have a ceremony, people get married, they exchange vows, right? Before man, before God, there's witnesses, people, okay, people get married, right? And that's when you're married. So regardless of what happens after that, you know, you're considered to be married. Your, your spouses, Mary was a spouse of Joseph. Well, what they would do oftentimes is they'd wait There'd be a time frame before the two people actually came together. So that's why you have this a little bit of time going by here, and then it's found out, like, wait a minute, she's with child, what's going on here? But they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. So he would say that, well, this must have been from before we got married. She's with child now, right? And that's why he was minded to put her away. So Jesus said, if you put away your wife for any other reason than that, then you're causing the person you put away, the wife you put away, to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. This is not well accepted today because there are so many people who have had divorce. But it's important to show what the scripture says so that you can be well informed and make good decisions. Maybe you've made a bad decision in the past, you've got divorced, but the Bible says that basically you're committing adultery if you go out and get remarried. And I'll explain that in a minute, but um, that's what Jesus is saying here. Flip over to Matthew chapter 19. Now, I also understand people wanting to get a divorce if you find out that your spouse has committed adultery. Even though that wasn't the caveat that the, that the Bible says was acceptable for divorce, the Bible put the death penalty on adultery, so that's kind of going to end that marriage that way. That's, that's God's design for ending that marriage. Was, okay, well, then that person's just going to be put to death. And, um, but of course, we don't, we don't have those laws in our country today, and, and that ends up causing more problems. We're not following God's law. Nothing's ever going to, the justice isn't going to be served the way that it should, and the effects of that aren't going to come across. And I've said this, preached this in other sermons many times before, you know, if it were against the law and punishable by death for people committing adultery, I think there'd be a lot less adultery going on. I mean, I really do. I honestly believe it would be a good deterrent that if someone thought I might be put to death if I get caught committing adultery against my spouse, I might think a little bit harder about this before I just go off and do something extremely wicked. You could lose your life over it. And that, you know, and God's law states that. And, and I feel for people who've been, who've been, you know, so, uh, who've had that happen to them. I mean, that's, that's horrible. It's a horrible sin. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 19, we're going to see the attitude of the Pharisees. 
which is really ironic. The, the irony here is that the people who will look at the way that we understand the Bible as being, oh, you're legalistic, you're like a Pharisee. You think that people who commit adultery should be put to death. You, you're like a Pharisee. No, actually, it's the exact opposite. Because the people that will typically say that would be the same ones that want to be able to get divorces for every cause. That want to be able to just say, oh, well, he was looking at pornography, so he left me already in his heart, and he's committed adultery in his heart already, so I should be able to get a divorce. Or what, like all, just whatever reason they want to come up with to get a divorce. Look at verse number 3 in Matthew 19. The Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's what they were asking. Gee, can we just divorce our wife for any reason we want? That was the attitude of the Pharisee. Not the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. That was not their attitude. It was, we want to be able to divorce our wife for any reason. Verse number four, and he answered and said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So they're asking about divorce. He didn't even bring up divorce or the law. He's just saying, you know what? He quotes Genesis, and he says, this is why man leaves father and mother, and they cleave their wife, so those two are one flesh. And he's saying, God joined those two together. Don't let man divide that asunder. And this is why we started in Malachi chapter 2, and this is, this is the way that God's plan was originally anyways, regardless of his law. It was, hey, when a marriage happens, it is until death. They, they are to stay married. Because then they ask about the law. They say, well, wait a minute, verse number 7. They say to him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And notice how they say, did Moses command to get like, you must do this. No, that's not. That's not the way it's written. He's not saying you've got to give a, a bill of divorcement if they do this. It's something that's allowed. It's not something that's commanded for them to do. Verse number eight, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you. Does he say suffer means he allowed you to. He didn't command you to. He suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He's saying, you know, that was allowed because God knows that your hearts can be very hard and unforgiving over events like that that are, yeah, it's a big deal. But he's saying God knows the hardness of your heart and allowed for that situation to, to, to get a divorce. He says, but that's not the way that God planned it or wanted it from the beginning. He says, from the beginning it was not so. Verse number nine, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And we see Jesus reiterating the same exact phrase, the same exact statement. If it was fornication, which is pre-marriage, he finds out about it, they haven't really consummated the marriage yet, yes, that was allowed. But every other reason, any other reason than that, he says you're committing adultery. You're going to cause her now to go out and she's going to marry someone else and commit adultery. Verse number 10, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. So they're like, whoa, you mean we can't just get a divorce if, we, you know, if things aren't going well? Then maybe we shouldn't even get married at all. But that's not the right attitude. <laughs> Hopefully you don't have that attitude with your spouse. Like, wait, what do you mean I can't just divorce her? I don't know if I want to get married. Well, but see, it is, it is something serious to consider. Yeah, that's right. It's definitely something you don't just take lightly. Because when you take on a marriage, when you decide to make the vow, that's something that you do with a full understanding that we aren't going to just get a divorce. This isn't going to end like that. That's not an option. I told that to my wife from the very beginning. Divorce is not an option. We do not, this isn't something that we're going to entertain. This isn't something that even should cross your lips. And I'll tell you that, you know, all, everybody, you're married. 
it's extremely, you ought never to even mention divorce amongst yourself. Never do that. That is a mistake. That is folly. That is hurtful. I know oftentimes people get, get mad. They get upset. They get in the heat of the moment. They have fights. That is really hurtful. And you know what? You can't take your words back. And when you bring up something like that, that is like the beginning of a betrayal of trust anyways. I mean, you ought to be able to have that understanding and that, that safety of knowing that at least we're married and that we're not, I mean, we made the vow till death do us part. Don't go throwing that around talking about divorce because you're upset with your spouse. That is a, that is a horrible thing to do. Because when you make that vow, you, you're there, you become one flesh. You need to be able to rely on each other. And yeah, even in the bad times, even when things are not going well at all, and you're button heads, and you're fighting, whatever's going on, you need to be able to have the, the, that base level of comfort of knowing that, well, we're always going to be married. We'll get through this. You have to have that understanding and not just be willing to even suggest that you're just going to go off and divorce somebody. Amen. That does a lot of damage to the relationship. It really does. And especially, I mean, because when someone says that, it, it really just changes the dynamic. And you're going to be thinking like, like the man might be, well, I'm supposed to be in charge, but now I'm worried about my wife divorcing me. So what am I going to do now? Is she just going to leave? I don't want her to leave. I want to keep this marriage together. You know, it just throws all of this stuff that you should never have, that should never even come up. It should never cross your mind. It's a wicked thought. It's a, it's a wicked attitude and it's a wicked thing to say to even suggest that you're going to get a divorce when we see what the Bible says about it. Verse number 11, so Jesus is going to explain a little bit further now. It says, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. This is fully in context with his teaching about people being divorced and not getting remarried. A eunuch is somebody who basically uh, is unable to reproduce. Okay, let's try to keep it simple. So oftentimes you'll find uh, a man that would be castrated and had a specific job, say, for, for royalty, for, for a king or something like that, and he would be in charge of maybe the king's concubines or the king's treasures or whatever. And in order to have that job, he was, he was made into a eunuch, someone who's just been castrated. So that he's not a threat in that way to, to his, for his position. And the Bible's explaining, hey, there's some eunuchs that were just born that way from their mother's womb, unable to reproduce, una you know, unable to, to have that. There's some that were made eunuchs of men where that's what happened. And then it says there's some who've made themselves eunuchs, not meaning they physically castrated themselves, but they made themselves eunuchs and saying, well, now I'm going to abstain from that. Why? Because they've been divorced. So they're going to say, well, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm not going to have that relationship anymore. It's as if I'm just a eunuch now because I'm going to remain celibate un, you know, until I die or until she dies or whatever. Right? That's the, that's the thinking here is he's saying because... Once you get the divorce, you can't undo that. I mean, unless you get reconciled, that's one option. So people have been divorced, you have an option of getting reconciled. But if, the, if, if one spouse has already gone off with another person and gotten married, that's off the table. Reconciliation can't happen anymore. So now your only option to do things according to Scripture would be wait until that person dies. Because at death is when that law ends when that vow is over. Turn to um, yeah, go to Mark chapter 10.
Actually, no, go to Luke 16, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through Mark 10. It's basically saying the same thing that we've already read. I'm going to read it for you just because it, it's that important to see that this is in the Bible over and over again, just like we're reading about marriage and, and you know, husbands and wives and what, and what they should be doing to have a good marriage. This is found over and over again in Scripture. This, this rule about divorce is not up for debate. And before we get into 1 Corinthians, I need to establish this from the law, from Jesus Christ himself, and then we're going to get into 1 Corinthians. Because 1 Corinthians 7 is what everybody wants to turn to that wants any excuse under the sun to get a divorce. That's the passage that they're going to turn to to try to say, no, 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 this is acceptable. So we're going to first just lay down all of this scripture that's very clear that is saying this is the way it is. So I'm going to read for you from Mark 10 too. The Bible says, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Same thing we already saw in the book of Matthew. It says, And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. This comes up over and over again. It was a subject of, of conversation back then. It's a subject today. It's an important subject because people get married and divorced. It happens. It's a reality. And it's always been a reality. And it's very personal. So, you know, this comes up. And the disciples ask him, it says in verse 11, And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth, her, committeth adultery against her, against his ex-wife. You're committing adultery when you go and get married to someone else. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Now, I want to make this point, and I want to make it very clear. Uh, we were actually just talking about this before service because... <coughs> What you've already done in the past, you can't undo. And what you don't want to do, let's say someone has already been divorced and remarried. Well, that's wrong. And that's what the Bible's teaching. That's what Jesus is teaching. But you can't undo what you've already done. And when you've made that second set of vows to another person, you can't make that right by then getting a divorce from that person, right? So, if you've already been divorced, whoever you're married to now, stay married to that person <laughs> and don't get another divorce. And if, you, if you're not remarried, don't get remarried. That's what the Bible is teaching. It's very simple. You, you, there's nothing you can do to turn around and, and change what's already happened. But what you can do is move forward and move forward with what the Bible says and just do what's right from here on out. Luke chapter 16, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And people want to do a lot of self-justifying when they're thinking about getting a divorce. Why they're right and their spouse is wrong. We know what God knows the whole situation. And God knows the heart. And you know what? Some people might have bad things happen. But at the end of the day, what the Bible says is the reason for divorce is what it says. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse number 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. These are not even all of the references where Jesus is saying these statements. It's most of them. It's not all of them. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 now, having, having laid all of that groundwork from Old Testament and New Testament. We already looked at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 this morning. In this morning's sermon, we're going to look now more in the middle part, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 
Bible says in verse number 10, and this is important because what we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's actually very unique in the, in the Bible. Because we're going to see the Apostle Paul write something here. And we're going to get to it in verse 12. He says, but the rest speak I, not the Lord. Well, the Apostle Paul is given this opportunity to, to say what he thinks. But he makes very clear the distinction between this is God's commandment and this is what I think. This is God's commandment, but this is, this is, um, you know, this is not God's commandment. This is just what I think. Let's look at verse number 10 first because he's going to specify clearly what's God's commandment. Verse number 10, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So what's God commanding in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Don't get a divorce. Don't depart from your husband. Don't leave. Don't do it. But and if she depart, because we're living in the real world, she shouldn't. The command is don't do it. But if she does, Okay, here's what you do. If she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So those are your options. Either you get reconciled or you just stay unmarried. That's it. Those are the choices for, for people who have been divorced. He says in verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. And see, this is what everybody wants to go to now. After the very clear commandment, say, this is what God says. Don't get divorced. Don't leave. But if you do, you got to remain unmarried. And here's the thing, too, though. What the Apostle Paul is writing is not contradictory to God's commandment. So, so understand that, too. What he's saying here is not in any way a contradiction of God's word. So it's not like this is not or shouldn't be part of Scripture because this is Apostle Paul speaking. I still believe he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So it does belong in the Bible. It is the word of God. But it's not the commandment of the Lord that was very clear like he was stating. If that makes sense. Hopefully you followed that. But verse number 12, he says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Nothing he says contradicting God's command of don't leave. He just added, well, if you'd be pleased to dwell with them, then stay. Don't leave, you know. But that's what God already just commanded. That's what, that's what he just got done saying. Verse number 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So he's dealing with the situation where, let's say one, one person is saved and one's not. Because I've heard people say this, well, my husband's not saved or my wife's not saved, so I needed to get divorced and, and marry someone who is saved because the Bible says that we shouldn't be unequally yoked together, right? So they, they try to use these other verses to justify divorce when, first of all, that wasn't the option in Deuteronomy 24. It wasn't, that wasn't the reason. So you can't just go and start applying different verses when there was only one, one way that it was given. We already saw what Jesus said about it. So you can't just making up your own things. But the Bible saying here, he's like, well, hey, you don't even know. You're going to be, you know, what you can gain from, like what your spouse can gain from you. Now, look, not everyone was saved when they were younger. Some people got married as unbelievers. One person gets saved. The other person's still unsaved. But you don't just ditch that person now because they're unsaved. How about you try getting them saved? Right? I mean, that's the situation you're in. Yeah, you both got married. It doesn't nullify the marriage. Your salvation has no impact on a marriage, on the vow, as far as whether or not it's valid. Of course it's valid. You got married. But then he says this in verse number 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such, case, in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, he doesn't, does he say, 
But if, you're, if your spouse wants to leave, get a divorce? He doesn't say that. That's not what he's saying. At the end of the day, he's saying, look, if, if they end up leaving, I mean, it's kind of like, what else can you do? What else can you do? You let them depart. He doesn't say get remarried. He doesn't say get a divorce. But I mean, if someone's going to leave you because you got saved and they're not saved and, and whatever, and that causes problems in the marriage and they decide to leave you, there's really not much else you can do. But that doesn't absolve the marriage and that doesn't okay a divorce either. Um, and that's why he follows up verse 16 saying, well, you, how do you know whether you're going to save your husband? How do you know uh, whether you're going to save your wife? Uh, jump down to verse number 39 here because the, the chapter closes off. And see, this, these are the passages where people will say, oh, well, my, your husband left you already in his heart because he was looking at something he shouldn't look at or he was talking to people he shouldn't have been talking to or he had, whatever, like whatever the reason is that, that people want to give. Well, he's already, he's already left you. And they, they'll go to this saying that this is, this is a reason to get a divorce. But the preponderance of evidence in Scripture is just is all consistently saying the same thing. 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse number 39. The Bible says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Just stating that marriage lasts until death. That vow, that marriage, that's why when someone gets divorced and then gets remarried, you're committing adultery, is because that, that marriage lasts until death. So since that is still in effect, regardless of, you know, unless it was that one case. Un and that's why even in the Old Testament you see that the wife was allowed to go and get remarried under those conditions. Under that specific set where it was allowed, that was it. Marriage wasn't consummated. Uncleanness was unfound. Was found in... in Bill of divorcement. As Jesus said, same thing, except it be for fornication. That was the situation. Every other situation where people are getting divorced, which is 99.9% .9 probably of all divorces that have happened already, like in this country, modern divorces, don't fall under those conditions. Which means that as long as your ex-spouse is still alive, you know, you commit it, you're committing adultery because that vow was until death do us part. Uh, last place I'll have you turn, turn to Numbers chapter number 30. Numbers chapter 30. Because what you do when you, when you get married to someone is you're making a vow to them. And it's for richer, for poorer, right? In sickness and health and poverty and wealth till death do us part. And I know there's other in there. I don't have it memorized, but um, it's good and bad, right? For everything that happens, it's good. We're going to stay together. Yeah, that's the easy part. But the whole point of the vow is for all the bad things that happen. When someone's sick, when we're poor, when, you know, doesn't matter. We're going to stay together. That's the vow that's being made. You're promising each other. They're called wedding vows. And in Numbers chapter 30, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. You make a vow unto your wife or unto your husband. The Bible, God expects you, demands that you keep that vow. You've made that promise. You need to keep that. Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, when thou, when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. And Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. 
pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? When you make that vow and then say, oh, no, I was just kidding. Oh, it was a mistake. I didn't really mean to make that vow. That's going to make God angry at your voice. Say, no, you, you made that vow not just to your wife. You made that vow before God and man. And you're promising that day before everybody what you're going to do. You need to keep your word. Children need to learn. They need to keep their word. People need to recognize marriage is not dating at the next level. It's, it's for life. It's a commitment. And whatever state you're in, if you've been divorced and you're unmarried, stay unmarried. If you're, if you're married right now and you've been divorced already, stay married. And if you haven't been married yet, take it seriously, whoever you decide to get married to, and understand that divorce is not an option. This is not something that we're going to have on the table as, as something we're going to consider at any point in our marriage. Bow our eyes, have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great wisdom and truth that, that you've revealed to us in your word. God, I pray that you please help us <coughs> to be able to, to make good choices. Lord, these are uncomfortable truths, and um, I know it's caused people to leave the, the other church I was part of just over this teaching alone because because. It's hard for people to accept it, Lord, and I pray that you would please just help us to just do what's right in your eyes and be able to be strong and, and have the courage to, to make good choices and just to be right with you, Lord. Um, unfortunately, our, our decisions and our actions have consequences, and, and sometimes they have long-lasting consequences, Lord, but uh, we have to learn how to deal with it and, and to live with it and God, we just ask for your grace and your mercy and just help us to, uh, to teach us and guide us in the right way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.